Lee is at Legacy Health Systems in Portland, Oregon, and is the 21st president of SAGES. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for, for asking me to do this, I think. Um, I, a couple weeks ago, I got a phone call uh, from SAGES, and they asked if I would consider taking Tom Dent's place in a presidential debate. I was quite honored to do that. Tom's a senior di diplomat, somebody I've admired for a long time. <clears throat> I said, who am I going to be debating? And he said, it was uh, Dr. Ken Ford. <laughs> and I felt truly set up. <laughs> Ken's also one of the respected doyens. And if you don't know him, I think you can get the flavor because lo and behold, when I came to Sages two days ago, Tom Dent was sitting in a meeting with me. And I said, Tom, I thought you weren't coming to Sages. They asked me to give your talk, your, your debate with Ken Ford. And he just get, kind of gave me this funny, sly smile and he kind of chuckled. <laughs> and then uh, Barbara Bercy yesterday came up to me and said, honey, just get up on the podium and lay down on the floor. <laughs> so that kind of gives you the flavor of what I'm up against. If you haven't heard Ken Ford speak, uh, he's often, I think he's truly one of the great orders, not just of surgery, but uh, uh, of all the professionals that I know. And in fact, he's often compared to Morgan Freeman, the great actor uh, who plays many roles. But I think one of those roles that he's best known for is this, and I really feel in this position, this is a movie called... Uh, um, Bruce Almighty, and you'll see Morgan Freeman playing God. So the person who sounds like Ken Ford was chosen to be God, and I feel a lot like the other guy. But anyway, luckily I was given the right side of the debate, so uh, as we could see by the preliminary questions, at least uh, things are stacked in my favor uh, in that way. Uh, harken back to the revolution of 20 years ago. Amazing that it was 20 years ago, uh, but it was. When Lap Coley came on the scene for general surgery, uh, we often refer to that as a, a revolution. We think about how surgery was practiced in the past and how these pioneers introduced this and, and what it did to general surgery and why did it do that. Well, it, it did that because it was so patient friendly and it turned out it's exactly what the public was asking for out of surgery. It was user friendly. It got them out of the hospital quick, it kept them out of the hospital, it got them back to their kids, it got them back to their work, and, and it was really a great thing for the public. It was a great thing for our patients. And that's what drove laparoscopic surgery. Uh, a lot of surgeons were busy in their practice, didn't really want to go to a course, didn't really want to learn things uh, until their public uh, started demanding it. Laparoscopic, the introduction of laparoscopic surgery has often been called one of the greatest advances in the 20th century in, in, surgical, in, in surgery, ranked right up there, this is Jim Thompson in his presidential address several years ago, ranked right up there with anesthesia, surgical nutrition, organ transplant, cardiac bypass. This is from his presidential address. Uh, so this is truly something incredible. And the reason it was incredible because of, the, of its now documented, two, cent, two decades of this, Hardcore documentation, randomized perspective studies, it wasn't just our intu intuition that said that these small incisions and minimal access were better for our patients. It's documented, it's irrefutable that these procedures are patient-friendly and better for people. Less pain, less scarring. You can determine if somebody needs a major cancer sur surgery without opening them up. Uh, less immunocompromised, fewer complications, fewer wound problems, out of the hospital quicker. And really, it adds down to that patients are allowed to get back to their normal life in a quicker way. I mean, this is a great advance in, in patient care. I think we all know that. It, you know, it, it had a lot of ramifications as well. I mean, it spawned a new way of training surgeons, a whole new paradigm. We had to train 20,000 general surgeons in the course of two or three years how to do a totally different way of doing surgery, a different way of thinking about surgery. Minimal access, I mean, is a foreign concept, I can tell you, to a lot of people. It spawned novel courses, these day courses that sprung up. Sages was a leader in this, uh, to bring people in, get them up to speed quick, and get them out the door. Fellowships were created. Uh, for the first time, industry is in intimately involved, and surgeons worked with them side by side to teach them. Surgeons worked with industry to develop the new instrumentation that we needed. Uh, we created paradigms for education like virtual reality, 
All this was the spawn of, uh, of the laparoscopic revolution. And it grew and it grew. We kept adding more procedures. As new instruments were designed, new procedures came on, and it just was one after the other after the decade of the 90s was an incredible advance to the point where by the year 2000, essentially, every major surgery had been done in a minimal access fashion. Aortic aneurysms were done, lung resections, lung volume reduction, retroperitoneal surgeries, nephrectomies, donor hepatectomies for transplant, major liver resections, it's all doable laparoscopically. Patient friendly, you can do everything. Uh, this whole revolution drove Surge's membership. It, it made SAGES what SAGES is today, the, the second largest surgical organization in the United States, the largest general surgical organization. The gener and what was it? It was that 1990 revolution of, uh, uh, of uh, laparoscopic surgery. So, uh, you know, it generated a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, everybody was excited in 1990, 1992, 3, 4, 5 at the growth of this, what we were doing for our patients, how exciting this was that we were changing the face of surgery, that surgery would never be the same again, that we'd never treat patients the way that we did in the past. We'd never open patients up and uh, spill their guts and uh, do it the old way. I, I can tell you, my generation, we looked at that in 1992, 93, when we were starting to do fundoplications and adrenalectomies, and we thought, by God, by 2010, 95% of surgery is going to be done laparoscopically. I mean, this, seriously, we really thought this. The instruments were coming fast and furious. It was great for our patients. Our patients were springing sprang up out of their hospital beds and going home the same day. It, it was incredible. Well, uh, it didn't work out that way, 2020. Overall, 28% of surgeries in the United States are done laparoscopically. 28%. WTF, which Lena Caton today found out meant website task force. But 28% uh, of surgeries are done this way, two decades into it. And I think that's terrible. I think that's a shame. And I think that's unethical. You look at it in particular, and some have done better than others. Appendectomy, this is uh, data that was just published last year. Appendectomies, actually there's more laparoscopic appendectomies done than open. That's a success. But it's not 95%. It has, nothing's reached that uh, cholecystectomy level. And some are, are fairly pathetic. Anti-reflux surgery, yes, more are done laparoscopically, but there's still a lot of open anti-reflux surgeries done. Does anybody in this audience think that an open anti-reflux surgery is better than a laparoscopic? Well, a third of them are still done open. Uh, colectomy, just starting to turn. I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Wexner was doing laparoscopic colectomies in 1991. Uh, randomized national trials show that it's infinitely better. England, for God's sake, Desmond, just mandated this year, mandated that all colectomies done in the UK should be done laparoscopically because of the evidence. The United States, pathetic. Even my field of esophageal surgery, we've actually seen a downturn in the number of laparoscopic anti-reflux surgeries being done. Um, I mean, it should have been the ball hit out of the park, all-time success. Well, why is this? Uh, why, how could this happen? How could this unethical thing happen? Well, I think it's a failure of training. I think we've failed to train and, and we failed to make laparoscopy universal in the public's domain because we failed to make it universal in our residency training programs. You know, the problem is uh, the volumes of technology and surgery are high. General surgery residency is both overreaching. They try to do a little bit of everything and underachieving. They don't put an emphasis on minimal access surgery. The average number of advanced laparoscopic cases is variable but consistently, consistently low for a graduating residence. Teachers are less willing or able to teach and certainly not willing to take the time to teach the extra manual skills and cognitive effort that laparoscopy takes. 
and they spend more time addressing uh, improving improvement of the residents' working conditions than they do actually to um, providing ethical care for the patients. Right now, 75% of graduating residents feel that they need additional postgraduate training to achieve any level of competence. And I can tell you in laparoscopic surgery, when it's looked at specifically, 75% also felt unready to perform any type of advanced laparoscopic surgery on their own when they graduate. So we're not gonna achieve 95% of people getting a laparoscopic surgery that they deserve until we get residents leaving comfortable with doing laparoscopic surgery. I think to some extent this is our own fault. We created this lap coli paradigm for education. That was a weekend course, amazingly efficient to put 20,000 surgeons through to learn lap coles. But we taught the procedural mechanics only when we did this. We brought them in a room, didn't give them much background except, hey guys, listen for two hours, here's how you do it, here's the complications, don't, don't do any complications. Took them in a lab, said, gave them a diagram, said you put this trocar here, this trocar there, this trocar there, you move your hands this way, and you pull the gallbladder out of the belly button, and it never got deeper than that. Couldn't do any deeper than that in a weekend. I think this led to a deep, uh, to a lack of a deep understanding of the disease treatment in a relationship that you get in a five-year residency with open surgery. It also, as we've heard today, as uh, Richard Bell talked about, uh, limited repetition limits your muscle memory learning, uh, your neural network reprogramming, reprogramming, reprogramming that you need to be a good laparoscopist, and you don't build up a mental library of potential outcomes that you can operate against uh, that's so critical in open surgery. Dr. Bell said at the presidential address just a few hours ago, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to achieve mastery it's not competence, this is achieve mastery of something. Do we provide that to our residents? We do, we do it open, and we're certainly not making an effort to provide that for them laparoscopically because you look at the average number of laparoscopic cases, this is hard to read, but it, you'd be totally depressed even if you could read it. The average number of laparoscopic cases that the residents graduate with is minuscule, five, two, 10 except for lap coles. They get a lot of lap coles because that's what all their teachers are comfortable with. So, you know, I think it's really, can we have sound? Job is off system. I think it's really a factor of as a teacher doth teach, so does the student learn. And this is the way we're still teaching them. The first rule of diagnosis, gentlemen, eyes first and most, hands next and least, and tongue not at all. Look! Have you looked? Yes, sir. See anything? No, sir. Very good. Carry on. Gently, man. Gently. You're not making bread. Don't forget to be a successful surgeon. You'll need the eye of a hawk, the heart of a lion, and the hands of a lady. You found it? Yes, sir. Well, what is it? A lump. Well, what do you make of it? Is it kidney? Is it spleen? Is it liver? Is it dangerous? No, don't worry, my good man. You won't understand our medical talk. <laughs> uh, you, what are we going to do about it? Um, cut it out, man, cut it out, and where shall we make the incision? Nothing like large enough. Keyhole surgery, damnable, couldn't see anything, like this. I don't worry, this is nothing whatever to do with you. <laughs> so, Dr. Ford, I give you that to answer. Are we really being ethical with our patients? Shouldn't laparoscopy be, be universal for our patients? Shouldn't we give to our residents a universal immersion in laparoscopic surgery in our training programs so we can build their manual skills or mental capacity and most importantly make them comfortable living in a minimal access world so that they feel good when they leave our residency programs and go out. I think if we can commit to this time, time to teach them this way that uh, they'll be totally comfortable with it and can bring uh, this wonderful uh, gift to our patients. And, Laparoscopy is not the end of everything. As we know, things are changing, continuing to change, and we're falling further and further behind. How are we going to teach them interventional radiology techniques? How are we going to teach them flexible and mass advanced uh, interventional endoscopy and even things like notes? If we can't bring them to laparoscopy, we're in big trouble. So I want to thank uh, our moderators for asking me to do this. Uh, Barbara, I didn't lay down. I hope you're proud, and uh, thank you very much.